the council at Jerusalem. This is Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might fear from the lip, hear from the lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. May God bless the reading of this word. In the 17th century, or actually beginning in the mid-16th century, there were a group of people, uh, Christian people, to be found in England and Scotland, who were known as the Puritans. They were a group of people, much maligned actually by history, Uh, who really had a burden on their hearts to live according to the scriptures. They were very, very godly people and devoted to God's word in a way which you rarely see today. We come to church of maybe 10 minutes, half an hour or something rather before the meeting. They would often be there two or three hours before and spend the time discussing the word of God and having a great time of fellowship and rejoicing. They were really wonderful Christian people. But, (coughs) of course, they supported Parliament when Parliament uh, rose up against King Charles I. And after the Restoration, when King Charles II came to the throne, uh, these folk (coughs) were um, much maligned and indeed history was kind of rewritten about them so that they became quite mean, nasty, narrow-minded, almost cruel. But they were, in actual fact, originally very, very uh, fine people whose desire and hunger was to live in a way that would glorify God. Not perhaps the way that we would be comfortable with in our society, but certainly in theirs, um, they were very, very strong in their faith and contented with uh, the relationship they had with the church, with each other and with the Lord. In Scotland, one of these men, a man named Samuel Rutherford, Reverend Samuel Rutherford, who died in 1661, 
had devoted himself to preaching and proclaiming the word and writing (coughs) about the greatness of God. And he was one of the very early teachers who spoke of what we call, or some people call, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, although he did not give it that name. It was uh, often known in in, uh, times long ago as the second blessing. And he spoke in glowing terms of this wonderful experience that was available to the life of the believer and uh, the Holy Spirit coming in, he felt, was as great as, if not greater, than the initial experience of salvation. I suppose that's debatable, but uh, he felt that it was just the wonderful, mighty thing that could come into a person's life. Now, he was an ardent Presbyterian, and it was quite unusual for Presbyterians at that period to speak of being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, historically, little had been said about the coming of the Holy Spirit for hundreds and hundreds of years because in the Roman Catholic tradition, the Spirit only came to certain individuals who were then declared to be holy and and, uh, often given almost magical powers, that is, the people that we know of as the saints. And they were The Spirit, in Catholic terms, was not available to everyone, only to those select few that God had chosen to give the Spirit to, which, of course, was completely different to what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the church as it was and he came then to all believers and so all believers then became saints, not in the Catholic sense but in the sense of being wholly committed to God. Paul the Apostle encouraged the believers when receiving the Holy Spirit to live lives that would demonstrate the presence of the Spirit in their lives to such an extent that they would be seen as temples, holy men and women of God being filled with the Spirit and living lives of purity and holiness in the midst of a world that was anything but pure and holy. When Rutherford um, wrote his books, they had a profound effect on his world, so much so that in 1661, after the Restoration, it was, he was uh, to be charged with treason. And by the grace of God, he actually died of natural causes first, thankfully because if you were charged with treason and found guilty then, you didn't die a very pleasant death. I think (laughs) God wonderfully delivered him. But be that as it may, his writings survived and still survive today. And a century before last now, Spurgeon, who was a Baptist and not a Presbyterian, wrote of him that his works were among the greatest works that had ever been written by a Christian gentleman concerning the faith that we all share. So Rutherford was a mighty man of God, even if he's relatively unknown today, except by people who read obscure books. And... uh, My interest in him was really on this basis that at such an early time he recognised that there was such a thing as a second blessing made available to all of those who knew Jesus as their saviour. 
I've spoken before, I would imagine, uh, on the great move of God that took place in the middle of the 19th century, beginning in the 1840s, I think. Starting in the United States, many Methodists developed a hunger and a desire to get back to the teachings of John Wesley. And God responded to their prayers in an outpouring of the Spirit that caused this great spiritual awakening to take place that became known historically as the great American holiness movement. Many thousands and thousands of people came out of their orthodox churches filled with a hunger and a desire to live lives of purity and holiness. They took the name Pentecostal because the experience they felt they had was similar to or was that of the experience that took place on the day of Pentecost. At that time, they did not experience the glossolalia or the ability to speak in uh, foreign languages languages which were to them unknown and um, usually unknown to the hearers, they rather sought and found the infilling of the Spirit which enabled and empowered them to overcome the nature of sin. Augustus Toplady in his hymn Rock of Ages <coughs> wrote the lines, Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Augustus Toplady at that stage was a Methodist, um, very friendly with the Wesleys. Later he abandoned uh, Methodism and went back into his Anglican faith as far as I remember. But anyway, he, his emphasis that the water and the blood from thy riven so, side which flowed be of sin the double cure. What would he mean by a double cure? Cleanse me from its guilt and power. What did he mean by that? What was the water and the blood? The water was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And the blood, of course, is the blood of our Saviour which cleanses us from all sins. Top Lady recognised that man has two fundamental problems. The first problem is the sin that he commits. And that is dealt with completely and absolutely at the cross of our Saviour Jesus Christ where our sins, though they may have been as scarlet, though they may have been as crimson, they can be as white as snow, as white as wool, washed clean by the blood of the Saviour. So that deals with the sin that we commit. Half the double cure. The remaining sin is the nature of sin, that we inherit from Adam. We are a fallen race and this is our fundamental problem. <clears throat> the sin we commit can be dealt with at the cross of Jesus. But what about the nature of sin which constantly lets us down, which constantly, no matter how good we want to be, even as Paul the Apostle said, that which I want to do I find myself not doing and that which I don't want to do I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. And I think most of us <coughs> at one time or another in our life, if not always, can relate to that. There is much that we do that we wish we hadn't done. There is much that we do which we wish we weren't doing. 
and there are many things that we would wish to do, godly, holy things, that we just don't seem to be able to do. And one of them is this overcoming, this propensity or this leaning towards sin. On the day of Pentecost, unfortunately for us in modern times, people have begun to emphasise more the glossolalia, that is the uh, ability to speak in other languages. And there's nothing wrong with that. If God has given you that gift, that's fine. The scriptures describe it as the least of the gifts, but it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's all fine. Unfortunately, though, in all too many churches, it has become the most important gift. And, of course, what I have heard, and no doubt others have heard, people who have that gift claiming that unless you have it, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, I have heard of cases where people have said, well, you know, brother of mine, if you don't speak in tongues... And this is rather sad because that's simply a lie, a lie from Satan. It is not true. There are many thousands, indeed millions of Christians who are spirit-filled, who do not speak in an unknown language, have never spoken in an unknown language, and have no <coughs> leading from God to speak in an unknown language. But they are men and women of God, of faith, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and used by God in so many mighty and different ways. But in today's world, we have sadly drifted away from the realities that took place on that day of Pentecost. You may have been to a Pentecostal church where nobody knew you. You were a stranger in their midst. If then, whilst you were there, somebody got up and spoke in an unknown language, and was or wasn't, as the case may be, interpreted, that church was out of order because the scriptures are clear that it must not be used when there are strangers in the meeting. You may have been to a charismatic meeting where several people got up and spoke in, in uh, unknown languages. If there were more than three, they were out of order because the scriptures are clear there must be no more than two or three. You may have been there when a whole lot of people were <coughs> singing and continuing praising in the Spirit, speaking in unknown languages. If you were, they were out of order because the Scriptures declare that that is not acceptable. Now, I'm not in any way knocking <coughs> the gift of being able to speak in other languages, tongues if you will, I'm just simply saying that the scriptures lay down what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. And all too many of us in our experience, and I've been there, <laughs> break the rules of the Bible and don't even realise we do it. Or if we do know, we still just go ahead because we are a willful people and we have come to see this particular gift as being the most prominent and the most important when it isn't. But what else took place <coughs> on the day of Pentecost? There was a mighty rushing wind or the sound of a mighty rushing wind and then there were what appeared to be tongues of fire appearing on the heads. Now we rarely or seldom talk about the tongues of fire Fire purifies. Some years after the day of Pentecost, there was in Jerusalem, roughly AD 49 we think, a council held and representatives of the church came together. It's interesting to see as we read the story that among them were many Pharisees who had accepted that Jesus was indeed the Christ. And that was, I was actually quite struck with that. <clears throat> Here were these people, seemingly so rigid, and yet there were many of them 
who came to accept that Jesus was indeed who he said he was. And it reminded me of Nicodemus when he came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we, not I, but we know that you are a teacher come from God. Who are the we? The Pharisees. Many of them knew perfectly well but they just didn't want that kind of a saviour. They didn't want that kind of a Christ. They wanted a military saviour, someone who would come in with great power and authority (coughs) and drive out the Romans and set them up (coughs) as God's people on earth. But apparently many of them moved on from that position and did accept the Lord Jesus as the Saviour indeed and followed him. But then, of course, they decided, well, if the Gentiles are going to become like us, then they will have to be circumcised and follow the law. Now, this chapter 15 is a brilliant chapter in some respects because if people actually believed the Bible and read it, there would not be some denomination, some pseudo-Christian denominations in existence today that are out there proclaiming that you have to obey the law of Moses. There are, for example, something like 13 churches who demand that we worship on Saturday. And it's not just the Seventh-day Adventists, they are only one. There are others out there as well. Now, if they read the scriptures... Paul's teaching is quite clear. It doesn't matter what day you worship on as long as you worship. And of course this chapter is very clear that a Christian, a person who comes to know the Lord Jesus does not have to obey the old Jewish law anymore. He is freed from that. The only things that were laid on us as Christians insofar as that law was concerned was that we abstained from eating blood, that we abstained from fornication, that we abstained from things worship, um, things strangled, wasn't it, and, in, and from worshipping idols. So if we obeyed the simple teaching of the Bible, so many false cults, pseudo-Christian cults would simply not be in existence today. But unfortunately because of our nature of sin we don't seem to help ourse- be able to help ourselves but we keep denying God's word or trying to find some other meaning in it. I read the teachings of a Roman Catholic lady theologian which really intrigued me because I didn't know they had any female theologians. And she said, there are things in the Bible that you cannot deny. We cannot change them. So the only thing we can do is we'll ignore them. And that's what all too many people do. But when going back to the day of Pentecost, those tongues of fire sat on people's head. What did it symbolise? It symbolised purification, for fire purifies. And when at this council of Jerusalem, the Pharisee or converted Pharisees and others demanded that we in the church should follow the rules and regulations as laid down by Moses, Peter stood up and said, look, 
You know what happened when I preached the word of God to Cornelius, the Roman centurion. God poured out his spirit upon them as he did with us at the first. And he purified their hearts by faith. The purification of the heart, the infilling it with the Holy Spirit, as it was understood up until the early 1900s, was that God, through his Spirit, comes into the life of the believer and empowers or enables you and me to overcome that nature of sin that drags us down. There were some who went a little further, as people always do, and said, oh, I believe that the fire of the Holy Spirit, when it comes into your life, actually eradicates the nature of sin so that you become truly pure and holy. That sounded all right, except that our personal experience lets us know that whether we like it or not, from time to time, we do sin. Using the old phrase, in either word, thought or deed, So no matter how good we may be, we do find ourselves from time to time saying or doing or thinking something we didn't ought to. So, it's clear then that the sin nature cannot be eradicated like that, but it can be overcome. And that is the importance of the infilling with the Holy Spirit and the purification by faith and by fire God, in his mercy, strengthens us and enables us to overcome the propensity and leaning towards sin. And therefore, we are enabled to live a victorious Christian life. As John the Evangelist says, if we sin, Not when we sin, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ. So, in the event of us falling into sin, which sometimes we do, we have that blessed assurance that we can come to him and find forgiveness and mercy once we acknowledge our failure and our failing. We do not become perfect in the sense of without blemish. One of the things I hate about so many modern books is that they keep saying, oh, this would be better translated as. But in this instance, the word perfect would be better translated as blameless. We become blameless because Jesus Christ has taken our sin away and it doesn't matter how bad we were or how much to blame we were, we can find that forgiveness and mercy at the cross of Christ and through the purifying fire of the infilling of the Holy Spirit we can find the strength to overcome that nature of sin and live victorious lives. The Spirit comes in like the wind and moves in a very special and very real way and we surrender ourselves to his leading, to his direction and he takes us where he will and we go willingly because that is what it means to be surrendered completely to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I do ask that you would reach out to each of us today and cleanse our hearts by faith. Fill us, Lord, with your Spirit. Send upon us the fire of the Holy Spirit, the purifying, cleansing fire that will wash us, set us free, present us blameless, and enable us to overcome 
the nature of sin that so often discourages and drags us down. So I pray, bless each individual and family that's here today in Jesus' name. Amen.